One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Sales Hacker Podcast. That was my... Um, that's my like sort of uh, traditional announcer voice. At any rate, it's Sam Jacobs. It's your host. I am the founder of Revenue Collective. We are an exclusive community for commercial operators at growth companies all over the world. We're in six cities officially. I'm actually recording this from Austin, Texas, where we're trying to figure out if there's enough people that care about accelerating their careers at the VP level and above that want to join Revenue Collective that it makes sense to have an Austin chapter. But that's not the point of why I'm talking to you right now. Why I'm talking to you right now is because we've got Keenan on the show today. Keenan is the founder of A Sales Guy, which is his consulting firm, his recruiting firm, his training firm. And he's also the author of Gap Selling. And he is a passionate and controversial, some might say, sales leader and thought leader. And he's an incredible guest and got a lot of great insights. Really, you know, what comes through in this conversation is his passion for selling and his passion for being great. And it's really, it's really an amazing story. And then we also dive deeply into really the power of discovery and why Gap Selling, which is the book and the philosophy that Keenan teaches, is all about connecting this, this concept of a current state, which is untenable, to a future state, which is ideal, and making the current state as uncomfortable as possible. We've talked about that a lot in the podcast with other guests. Keenan does a great job of emphasizing emphasizing these ideas. Now, before we get to the interview, we want to thank our sponsors. The first is Chorus. That's Chorus.ai, the leading conversation intelligence platform for high growth sales teams. Chorus records, transcribes, and analyzes business conversations in real time to coach reps on how to become top performers. Now with Chorus, more reps meet quota, new hires ramp faster, and leaders become better coaches. Everyone in the organization can collaborate over the actual voice of the customer. So check out chorus.ai forward slash sales hacker to see what they're up to. And our second sponsor is, of course, Outreach. This is the leading sales engagement platform. Outreach supports sales reps by enabling them to deliver authentic communication at scale, from automating the soul-sucking manual work that eats up selling time to providing action-oriented tips on what communications are working best Outreach has your back. Now, without further ado, let's listen to this amazing interview with Keenan on the Sales Hacker Podcast. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. Welcome back to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today, we've got a very, very special guest. We've got Keenan on the show. Now, there are probably three people out there in the world that don't know who Keenan is. So, if you don't know who he is, he runs a sales consulting, recruiting, speaking, and training company called A Sales Guy, which of course he started. And he also wrote a very powerful and influential book in the field of sales called Gap Selling, which he's going to walk us through and talk to us about. So, without further ado, Keenan, welcome to the show. What's up, Sam Jacobs, my man? <laughs> if you all are out there listening and you don't know, we've recorded this two times already, and each time the computer crashed. So we're hopeful of this is the third time is the charm. But now at this point, Keenan and I know each other pretty well. So, Keenan, shit show. It's driving me insane. God. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. Let's hope. Let's hope and pray that this will work out. But you know, there, there's some. You've written this book, Gap Selling. You are a very you know influential and noteworthy thought leader on the sales scene and in the in sort of like helping companies grow sphere. But there's a few people out there that don't know who you are. So, in your words, tell us what a sales guy is and what you all focus on, and then we'll dive into a little bit of background, and then we'll talk about the book, Gap Selling. Yeah, yeah. So, a sales guy is a sales consulting, recruiting, and training company. We help companies make their number. Like we are trying to change the way people sell by providing the guidance, direction, insight, knowledge, and foundational elements to developing and executing just badass sales teams. That's impressive. And then, and there's a recruiting component too. So, you also help them find great salespeople. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, awesome. which can be tough sometimes. <laughs> and is it uh, is it international, national? Do you have a sort of geographic area of focus where most of your clients are? Just if we want to, no, hire it's you international, and... brother. I mean, you know, <laughs> we we it's it's what is it? Two thousand nineteen. People find you, and when you have a mouth as big as I do, and you've written a couple of books, and you have a decent online presence, they find you. Like I have to, I got to go to Ireland and two weeks and was in Australia earlier this year. And yeah, i am got to go to Israel soon. I'm all over the place. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Well, how did, let's, uh, how did you get into this? You know, what's your background? How did you become a sales guy, quote unquote, and, uh, and walk us through a little bit about sort of 
you know, the life's journey. And also along the way, I'm sure we'll talk about some of the concepts that inform your perspectives on gap selling. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I've been a sales guy my whole life. Like that's the bottom line. And I didn't even know it. Like my aunt used to call me that, you know, and I don't think she was being nice when she did it, but she was still used to call me that. I just had a knack for influencing people and, and really let's break it down. That's what sales is all about. It's about influencing people's decisions. And as a kid, like if I wanted to play a certain sport or play a certain game on the playground, you know, and all the other kids want to play kickball and I wanted to play hide and go seek, I'd get those kids, those kids played in hide and go seek if it came hell to high water. And I figured that out. Right. And then I was also a little hustler. Like I, I, you know, my school had this, this big raffle competition and I went out and sold more raffle tickets than anybody. I sold like 90 raffle tickets and nobody else sold anywhere close to that except this one kid who sold like seven books, which is 10 a book. And um, I did it door to door and I busted my hump. I mean, imagine how many doors you got to knock on to sell 90 tickets. You figure if you get one person to answer the door every four doors, you know, you get knocking on 400 doors. Well, this clown got his mom to come down when he found <laughs> out I sold more and got her to buy more tickets to put him over the top. And I remember the assembly. You want to see a kid seething. It, it's almost like if, if the sports, you know, games, they zero in on, on somebody sitting there not paying attention or picking their nose and they watch them. They would have found me because I was seething mad and I was just sitting in that thing and I couldn't even tell you what first place was, but second place was a, like a coupon for a free ice cream cone. I wanted to stick that up the principal's ass. I was so pissed off. <laughs> oh, oh, I Jesus. was human because he didn't earn it. Like the kid didn't earn it. His mom just walked in and bought him. Do we two, know? Two, do we know his name? Who is this kid? Oh, <laughs> I can't. No, I don't remember. I just remember I lost and I was mad because I worked so hard. But anyways, and so I did that most of my life. You know, I was a kid who started. I convinced all the kids, other kids, all the kids to pull their money, and we did lemonade stands. I built haunted houses in my basement. Like I was always selling and building something. And then, you know, in two thousand no, what ninety seven, I was living in South Beach, Miami. I was modeling. I did it for Tommy Hilfiger and and you know Eastern Mountain Sports and and you know it was called May Company back then and Nordstroms and I mean I did it for all kinds of stuff. My buddy called me up and said, Keenan, it's time to come home. You're not going to be a supermodel. You're getting old. I got a job for you selling chamber <laughs> memberships. <laughs> so I did the math in my head and said, all right, I'm going to come home. I'll sell chamber memberships. You're going to pay me a thousand bucks a week. And this is a 97. I was 27 years old. I was like, hell yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> had you ever lived in Denver before? Yeah, I actually had. I was. I had modeled in Denver and oh. finished school. And that's really how it happened. So I modeled in Denver and I did it part-time, finished school and didn't really have anything on the horizon. So, you know, modeling is sort of like baseball. You you go to markets and you build your book and you, it's called building your book and you shoot with as many people as you can. You do editorial stuff, you get as many gigs as you can and you build your book and then you go to bigger and bigger markets. Well, Miami was the stepping stone to getting to New York and you go there during the season, usually from about January to March, December to March. And so I figured, all right, I'll go down there, build my book and see if I get in with New York and keep going. And after about a month, month and a half, and I was doing okay, but it wasn't really going very far. That's when my buddy said, just come home, dude, come home. And I got a job for you. So I said, fuck it. I came home. <laughs> and so, and this is, I mean, obviously when you're modeling, you're selling your body and you're selling your, your good looks, but you know, the Denver chamber of commerce was your first official sales job, if I'm not mistaken, yes. walk us through. And that led you somewhere that led you somewhere that led you somewhere that ultimately led you here. Walk us through that process. And also super curious about, there was this moment in your career when you decided I've got to start sharing my insights and talking about my struggles and walk us through the development of that. Cause I think that was the inflection point that led us to this, to this moment right now. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. So I give my buddy credit. So he, he had his own business and he, he was a member of the chamber and uh, the president said, or the head of sales said they were looking for a new person. And he said, you got to hire this guy, Keenan. And so when he called me, he said, listen, Keenan, the chamber is packed with all these business minds and business people and who's who of Denver. So go there for one year, you'll meet all of these people and you'll be able to parlay that into a new job. So that was a good sales job on himself. I said, okay, that makes sense to me. So I went there and I broke every sales record you could imagine. Number one, biggest sale, most sales in a month, most sales in a year. Like I was crushing it. And uh, it was doing really, really well. And then this company came in that sold IT consulting services. I saw the writing on the wall. I mean, at the chamber, there's, I mean, it's it. There's, you're not really going anywhere. The average membership is like 600 bucks. You know, and, and I knew there was bigger, more complex professional selling gigs out there. So this company came in, it was IT consulting services. And I was like, ooh, I think this is a big sale. So I said that they would open an office in Denver. And I said, hey, man, I'd like to talk to you about coming to work for you guys. 
And he was like, look, you're an impressive guy. You, you, you know, I sold them a membership and I sold them one of the $2,500 ones. That's three X the average sale. Right. And, um, and he's like, I like what you're doing, but I think we're going to need some more um, expertise because you don't know anything about our industry and you've only been selling for a year. And I'm like, OK, because but I'll introduce you to the, the new branch manager. So the new branch manager shows up and he says, hey, I hear you're interested in coming to work for us. I said, yeah, totally. And I'm like, like I'm like a little Labrador retriever puppy. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, come on, come on. And uh, he goes, look, he goes, I've heard good things about you, but he goes, we're opening this brand new office. We need somebody is exactly what he said. He goes, we need somebody who can hit the ground running. You have, you have only been selling for a year and you have no experience in our space. What I'd like to do is have you come in in six months or so or a year after we've been established and we can give you the attention you need. And I looked at him. And I said, OK, that makes sense. But let me ask you this question. Have you found this person yet who has all this experience and can do the, hit the ground running? And he said, no, we haven't. And I looked him right in the eye and I said, I challenge you to find this person quickly because if you don't, you'll be, you'll be behind the eight ball because you could have hired me. I would have been training and been on the ground running by the time you found this guy. I challenge you to find that person quickly. It was my exact words. He chuckled a little and he said, okay, great idea. He calls me back two weeks later and this is exactly what he said. I'm not kidding. He goes, you son of a bitch. All I keep thinking about <laughs> you were saying, I challenge you to – and he thought it was the funniest thing. And so they hired me with this one other girl, just like when they hired me at the chamber with this one other guy. The guy that hired me at the chamber didn't make it three months. I became a top producer. They hired me with this other girl because she was the, you know, I, she was the safety net and I was the risk. She didn't make it three months. I was the number one rep in that company. I mean, in that branch. Then I became the manager. Then I became a partner. And so I just did that in three years, slayed it. And then another client came along. And they hired me to run their managed modem division. It was 125 people, 300 million in revenue. So I went from basically modeling on the beach of South Beach, Miami in 1997 to 2000 running a 125 person, $300 million sales division in three years. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then there was a point at which you just started. Is it you started a blog or like what you, there was a moment at which you started describing your experience. Walk us through that process and that thought process. Yeah. So what happened was, what happened was, what happened was <laughs> um, uh, my career went so fast that my resume couldn't support it, if you will. Right. So here I am running this and, and, and unfortunately it was in managed modem, which is basically provides a dial up service for all your big dial up companies. Well, they were moving to broadband and this company didn't have a broadband solution. So they went from flying high to basically nothing. And I lost my gig. Okay. No big deal. I went out in the, in the world to get a new gig. People were like, no, like I wasn't, it was before social. So I, I couldn't really compete. Like right? these guys that would run and doing the same thing I was doing. They were 45, 50, whatever with 15, 20, 30 years experience. So I started a company, it failed. Then I took another job, sort of had to take a step back, which I wasn't keen on. It wasn't a huge step, but it was somewhat of a step back. I wasn't keen on it. Crushed it there again, crushed it there again. So I said, I'm not going to be in a position anymore where I have to compete on my resume. I'm tired of this. Like, I'm not doing this. So I said, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a blog and I'm going to blog every single day about what it's like running sales teams, how to coach salespeople, how to build sales organizations, how to build processes, like the whole gamut. And then the thought was, you know, look, if a couple hundred people or a thousand people at best follow the blog and they know who I am and they like my stuff, if I ever need another job, all I have to do is say on the blog, hey, I'm leaving such and such place. Anybody know of any opportunities? And I figure, you know, if you get a thousand people out there that could, you know, that could help you find a gig, that would shorten the process. That was the thinking. That was the logic. That was like the first uh, kind of personal brand building, you know, in the era before LinkedIn, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And I was LinkedIn. I don't know if LinkedIn, it may, I mean, so I started in 2009. So I think LinkedIn was just starting or it wasn't very old. They were somewhere. around, but it wasn't the thing that you're describing wasn't very popular on LinkedIn at that point, which is, no. you know, thought leadership as a means of professional development. No. So that's what I did. And I wrote a blog post for 712 days straight, roughly, you know, I may have missed a couple here and there, but for all time purposes, wrote 712 blog posts and two years into it, it just all of a sudden, I mean, look, it was incremental, but people reaching out to me and 
that my stuff was Twitter was big at the time. Twitter and my stuff was getting retweeted all the time. And some some established people like Jill Conrad and others took notice and were sharing my stuff and saying, pay attention to this guy and and blah, 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 blah. And next thing I know, yeah, I've got people calling me up asking me to consult with them. So I you know, I left my job and started a sales guy. And the reason it's called the sales guy, no offense to any of the women are out there or anything, that was the name of the blog. So I had so much SEO cred and so much cred, it didn't make sense to me to try to come up with a new name. Yeah, you can't do it. So yeah. what are the core, you know, we can, I mean, this will probably move into the, the concepts of gap selling, but when you think about what you're teaching, you're, you know, you're flying all over the world, you are obviously a big personality, but you've got a lot of substance to share with people. What are the main themes that you were, that you were that you are exhorting and trying to get salespeople to adopt so that they can perform more effectively and they can crush it in the way that you did. Thank you. Great question. And, and you're right. I, I, I work really, really, really hard on the substance because when you have a personality like mine and you don't conform to the gray suit, blue suit, tie, shoe bullshit, people are looking for a reason to discount you. They yeah, just look at Right. So, uh, you know, I take pride. And and one of the things that, that I really lean into and I leaned into it most of my life, but didn't understand it until I started really breaking down the concept of gap selling is that selling is has nothing to do with you. It is not about you. Nobody could give a shit about you or your product or your services or anything. It's not about you yet. Most sales training has always pushed this idea that it's about you and your product. Like I remember some of the pitches in, 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 in decks I used to get when I first started opened up with, we're in the 500 and we have this many employees and we have this customer sat and we've got this and da -da, talking all about them. And the product, the customer's yawning. They're like, oh, I can just what? This is a waste, waste of my time. I, I don't care. And so I learned this. You know, it's so funny. I'll tell you a quick story. I learned this a lot as a kid because I used to get in trouble a lot as a kid. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> yes. Shocker. <laughs> yeah, shocker. I didn't do anything stupid like rob banks or steal cars or stuff like that. I just did stupid stuff that drove people crazy. Anyways, I wasn't even a kid, but one of the examples was when I was um, in college, I came home one night and I, I had a Jeep and I was with a bunch of buddies. It was like two in the morning and they had this big, huge lawn. Like think of an East Coast, you know, East Coast, East Coast school, big, huge, long green lawn and, and a winding road that went around it. I don't know what came over me, but like, hey, let's go four wheeling. And I just drove right across the lawn. Right. Well, of course, I'm going to get caught. I mean, I'm dumber than bricks. So I get caught and the dean says, you're off campus. They didn't kick me out of school. They kicked me out. of. They kicked me out off campus. Well, I was an emancipated minor. I had nowhere to go. I lived on campus. That was my home. I didn't make enough money to get my own apartment. I couldn't drive in every day. So I looked at the, I looked at the Dean. I said, listen, let me ask you a question. Is your, and I knew exactly what I was doing. I said, is your objective to throw me out of school? And she goes, no, look, she goes, you're a good student. You, you bring, it's a small school. She goes, you bring good value to the school, but what you did on the car, there's absolutely positively no way that I'm going to let you live, stay on this campus after what you did. And I said, listen, I appreciate that. But if your goal is not to notice, I said it twice. If your goal is not to kick me off campus, that is effectively what you're doing. I'm an emancipated minor. I cannot afford my own apartment. We're in Denver and Newton. It's too expensive. I don't have the money. I am going to just have to drop out. So I took her, I said, so what is your objective? And she goes, you need to be punished for this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, I appreciate that. And she sat there and she stared at me for a second. And you could see the wheels turning. <laughs> because what was happening is her desired outcome was not being met by the punishment. Does that make any sense? It makes sense to me. I love what you're doing here. Yes. So I just left it there and I didn't say another word and she, and a wheel to turn and she goes, okay, fine. I don't want to kick you off campus. I don't want to undermine your education. So here's the deal. You have to stay off campus for two weeks. So I hid in my girlfriend's dormitory and <laughs> I could come to class. I just couldn't spend the night. So I just, like, I literally found a way to hide out for two weeks and then showed back up on campus at night and got back into my room and went to my dorm. So I tell this story in that I learned a long time ago that you need to focus on the buyer. What is the buyer's desired outcomes? What does the buyer want to accomplish? What is the buyer's current state? What makes them unhappy with the current state? What is the future state they're trying to achieve? And how can you influence that? And that space between the current state and the future state is called the gap. And the bigger the gap, 
the greater motivation they have to buy, the more money they'll pay, the more engaged they'll be with you, and the higher probability you have of closing the deal. And that's what gap selling is all about, and that's what I learned. So how do you how do you teach it? it? Sounds like to the point of gap selling, the key. But tell me if I'm wrong. The key is making that gap as wide as possible and creating just this yawning abyss between the current state, which is. I guess hopefully what you're trying to get the buyer to understand is that their current state is an abysmal, you know, hellhole shit pile. And then the future is something beautiful and wonderful where everything has changed. How do you drive that wedge between that gap and make it as big as possible? Brilliant. Brilliant. And you, and you nailed it. And, and, you know, you used all the good Keenan words, but in this one, I actually use a much subtler, but I believe more impactful word. The current state needs to be untenable, Right. It yeah. needs to be untenable. And one of the things I say in training and I say in the book and, and, I, and I teach people is your job is not to tell the customer anything when it comes to their current state. You cannot tell the customer their current state because perceptions involved. What you can do and what you should do is you should ask enough questions to uncover the full extent and contextual elements of where they where they are today and what their environment or current state looks like and how it exists. And so the way that I do that is I break it down into five sections. In your discovery or in your engagement with your customer, you want to know as much as you can about the literal and physical environment they're in. And by the way, this is as it relates to the product or service you sell. Do not ask questions that have nothing to do with what you sell outside of the context of what you sell. But based on what you sell, you want to ask as many questions and you want to uncover the physical and literal environment in which that buyer is currently living and existing. And what I mean by physical and literal, it's not the problems yet. It's not that. It's just it's the non-judgmental stuff, right? So if, if let's say you sell cybersecurity, and I'm making this up as I go, so I'm probably going to stumble. But you just want to you may want to ask questions about the type of systems they use today? Is it on-prem? Is it off-prem? What type of software is it? Who's involved? How big is the organization? You know, blah, blah, blah. You just want to get the physical and literal. That's all you want. But then from there, you want to understand what are the problems within that current situation. And you want to talk, talk about, we can't do this. We can't do this. We're getting um, fishing, more fishing attacks than we like. We can't stop as many fishing attacks. We can't train our people. They're not, they're not following the rules. Like, they're not taking the training. They're blah, blah, blah. So now I know the problems. Then from there, I want to dig a little deeper to say I want to get to the impact of those problems. So because more phishing deals are getting, because people aren't taking the training, because of this, because of that, we're getting uh, actually more malware. We're having to buy more computers. And we have to shut down the network. We have people have to come in at 2 in the morning. We missed our numbers for Q4. You know, we got sued. We're out of compliance. We, we're, we're in a lawsuit over HIPAA. Like, okay, woo, that's a big impact. Then I want to go to the next level, but I want to understand, okay, what's the, the general emotional state of what's going on? And it could be indifference. It could be fear. It could be anger. And, and so when I understand that, now I've got a good, really good understanding. And the last thing I want now is the root cause. I want to be able to ask them or, in, or suggest to them what the root cause might be. Because the root cause then acts as my conduit to my service. Because if I know the root cause or I can explain to them what the root cause or I can get them to agree what the root cause is, and my product or service eradicates or addresses the root cause, I have just created a seamless transition from their current state to the desired future state. And then I go into that. So understanding this, what are you guys shooting for from a cybersecurity perspective? What are the future goals? What is it you're hoping to accomplish? How would you measure success? And you do the same thing with the future state, physical, literal, problem, what problems go away, the new impact, how is the organization going to be impacted by the new solution? the new desired emotional state. And then finally, the flip side of the root cause is what is the solution you're going to employ? What is the solution you could employ? When you take a buyer through that whole process, you don't have to do anything. They basically sell themselves. They tell you everything and they just walk themselves right through the door. That sounds, sounds sort of like easy to describe, but hard to implement. One of the examples that you've given me in the past that I thought was awesome was this concept of, was the example about a test, how much would you take to pass this? No, it was, um, it was like, how much would you take to save your life? Walk us through that metaphor. Yeah, that you, yeah exactly. 
Yeah, the pill metaphor. I tell this all the time. I love this. So I, what I say to people, I lose it in my training. I ask them, okay, how many of you have ever had a migraine? And a few people raise their hand. I said, okay, well, those of you who had it, you're going to appreciate this. I want everybody here to imagine they have a blistering, blistering, blistering migraine headache, light sensitive, noise sensitive. You can't get out of bed. It's Sunday morning and you can't get out of bed and you can't do anything. And I say, how many of you would pay five bucks for that? Every hand goes up. And I say, keep the hands up until you wouldn't pay it. And I say, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And hands start to come down around 100. I go, 200, a few more. And around 500, it's, it's fascinating. Like, I should, like, this is a really cool study. Almost every time I do this, right around $500 is where you, the majority of people's hands go down, no matter what group. It's, it's powerful. So I said, okay, great. I said, now let me ask you a few more questions before you decide. I said, how many, I said, what if I asked you, what do you have to do tomorrow? And, and you told me that you have a, and you said, oh, yeah, right. I have a, a proposal due. And I said, oh, what's the proposal for? And you tell me it's a sales proposal. I said, how much is it worth? And you say, it's worth $50 million. And I said, no kidding. And I'm saying, what's your commission on it? And you're like, $50,000. I'm like, you've got a proposal for $50 million, which is $50,000 um, commission due to you, due tomorrow? And you say, yes. I say, is it done? And you say, no. I said, can you get it done with this head headache? You say, no. I say, um, how much you quote? And you say, my quota is um, is 20 million. So I said, you're going to double your quota. You say, yes. I said, it's going to send you on President's Club. You say, yes. I say, what about accelerators? You guys have accelerators. You say, oh my God, I wasn't even thinking about that. Yes, I'm going to hit accelerators. I said, so this thing is worth anywhere from fifty to $100,000 to you. And you go, yes. And I said, well, how much would you pay for my pill now? Would you pay a thousand bucks? All the hands go back up. Right. And I say, would you pay 2,000, 5,000, around five or 7,000, all the hands come back down. And I said, okay, great. Now that I've got 7,000, let me ask you another question before, before we make this transaction. I said, how long has this been going on? And you say to me, it's funny you ask. I never had these headaches in my entire life until the last four months. And then I say, where does it hurt? And he said, that's weird. It hurts in one particular spot. And then I say, okay, wait, do, does it ever mess with your motor skills? And you say, yes. When I reach for my glasses or I do this, I miss them or I stumble a little. And I say, mind if I take a picture, i.e. MRI? And you say, yes. And I say, boom, you've got a malignant brain tumor. You're going to die in six months. <laughs> Jesus. Yes, right? And I say, you're going to die in six months. My pill will solve that problem and get rid of the malignant brain tumor. And I say, so I said, how many of you will pay um, $10,000 for my pill now? All the hands go back up. And then I say, how many pay 50000 100000 a million? Like every hand stays up. And then I say, okay, put your hands back down. And they all put their hands back down. I said, I want to do one more thing. I said, now that you've all been, I cured you all of cancer and you love this pill, you come work for me. And now you have to sell this pill. And then you, you have some guy on the phone who you just find out he has a malignant brain tumor and he's going to die in six months and, you, and the pill's a million dollars. How many of you come back and put in the CRM that this deal is going to close and you tell your manager, you're pumped, you're going to close this million dollar deal? About seven eighths of the hands go up. And I said, now, hold on a second. Let me ask you a question. How old is this guy? And they all just stop and stare at me. And, and I say, and he says, I say, he's 90 years old. And he lives in a nursing home and his kids haven't come to see him in 18 months. And he hadn't seen his grandkids in two years. And all the people he went into the nursing home with are dead except one other person. Who he and doesn't he does like. <laughs> yeah, who he doesn't like. I said, how many people think that person's going to pay a million dollars? All the hands went back down. And so what I do to illustrate this is for all intent and purpose, the pain in the problem is the same. It's the outcome. It's the space between the current state and the future state, that gap that drives the sale. So in the first one, when you could sit around all Sunday and drive and ride it out, it wasn't a very big gap. In the second scenario, when you've got all this money in hand and your jobs at hand, et cetera, it was a much bigger gap. And you're going to spend more time and effort to solve it. In the next one, where you're 35 years old or 40 years old, you're going to die soon. You're not going to see your kids graduate from high school. You're not going to walk your daughter down the lane down the aisle and for a marriage, you're like, hell no, I don't want to die. And it's every, it's the biggest gap in the entire world. But then when I bring it down and say you're 90, 95 years old, living in a nursing home, don't see your kids, you're still dying just like the 34 year old. But the impact of that is not nearly as big. So now you've shrunk the gap. And so if we're selling and we don't understand the size of the gap, we're not selling. We're taking orders. Because we have no influence on the sale whatsoever. 
That's what Gap's selling about. That's the metaphor. Is it as simple if, you know, if you're a salesperson out there listening and you want to sort of, you know, you're excited about this podcast, you're, in, you're inspired by what you're saying. Is it as simple as just, you know, stop talking so much and start asking more questions? Is that a good way to start practicing? Are you inspired, Sam? Am I inspiring you? I'm, I'm extremely inspired. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> do I, how do I sound? I usually sound like I'm just above catatonic. So maybe, you know, it's like. Yes, too- yes still, still. But that's okay. <laughs> I heard a little tweak in there. It's subtle. You have to pay attention. <laughs> exactly. It's all about my context and the gap. It's the impact. Yeah, exactly. Look, it's not easy. And I, I'm not going to bullshit people. I don't even try to bullshit people. And I, even with some of my clients, I say, you need to understand that some of your people will not be able to pull this off. You have to be smart. You have to listen. I do all kinds of exercise to show people that they're so entrenched in trying to get the customer to answer a certain way or they're looking for a certain answer that they're not actually thinking through the process. Right? So I was literally, so you have to ask questions that allow you to understand where the customer is, where they could go, what things could be affecting them. And if you can't do that, you're just not going to be able to get to the depth that you want. So I tell people you have to to have phenomenal critical thinking skills. You have to uh, have excellent business acumen and off the charts listening skills. And I guess it goes with critical thinking, amazing connect the dot uh, intuitiveness that you realize, oh, this means this and that means that and that means that. So here's a good example. I was in a training yesterday with a, with a SKO for a client, right? They sell a service that allows the adoption and use of software applications to be magnified. Like they, they minimize people, um, uh, what do you churn when people don't use, don't use an application. So a company spends a lot of money to put in Salesforce and no one uses it type of thing, right? Yep. Well, their, their application solves that. What also helps companies who have software externally. So let's say you're Slack and you're trying to build in all these users and people come on and they try a free trial for once and, and they never come back and use it. Well, that's, that's lost potential revenue. So this company solves that problem. Well, I asked them, how many of you have had the conversation with a potential client about what their growth goals are? Are they on the growth goals? And if not, what is the difference? Where did they? Th- where should they be today? Where are they today? Where do they want to be tomorrow? And none of the people ever had those types of conversations. And that's, I was like, that's, that's really depressing. Enable. Like, like none of them thought of it. And they're successful. They're growing like weeds, but it, they don't think like that. I also said the same thing inside. I said, how many of you ever asked the CIO or the head of sales when they invested in Workday, they invested in Salesforce, they invested in XY's SAP? How many of you asked them? What was the business case for that application? And are you meeting the business case today? None of them ever asked that question. I don't even work for them. And within two minutes of talking to them and understanding the business, I was like, well, that's how you sell it. If I've invested $20 million in implementing a software application, somewhere there's a business case and I'm supposed to get some productivity returns, right? Yeah. And so if I'm not getting those productivity returns, I'm losing on the business case. You're telling me you can get me back to those productivity returns because that's what your product does. So how in the world is nobody having that conversation with anybody? Blew me away. Yeah. Blew me away. Well, right? hopefully they, it now. yeah, go. They got it now. Oh, they, they figured out. They got it now. Smart people. Great group of people. I love them. <laughs> I love them. Good. Yeah. Um, we're around. But that's what I mean. Most people, it's just not intuitive. It's just not intuitive. One of, you know, there's this concept that you talk about a lot, uh, the difference between problem centric selling, which is, I think what we're talking about a little bit and product centric first, I think definitions are helpful. So walk us through the the difference between problem centric and product centric, and then talk to us about why product centric selling doesn't work. So the, the basically product centric selling puts your product at the core. Right, it's about the features. It's about the benefits. It's about what your product can do. It's how long the product's been in the market. It's how it was developed. It's just constantly focusing on the technology, right? The service that that the because the enablement element of it. Problem centric selling actually starts with uncovering, assessing, evaluating, and focusing on solving the problem. So in in product centric selling, right? 
product centric salespeople talk about the product. They focus on their company. They tell, they explain. They're motivated by quota. Our product experts have technical discussions, right? They react to demand. I need this. I need that, right? Their emails and cold calls come on and say, I'd like to talk to you about my product, right? Can I'd like to talk about how my product can do this? Problem centric salespeople actually talk about business problems, not the product. They focus on the buyer, not their company. They ask questions and inquire rather than tell, explain. They're motivated by the customer's success, not by quota. They're more like a business analyst. They have business discussions. They can create demand as opposed to react to demand. They rarely have to compete on price, where product centric product centric people have to compete on price all the time, right? Problem-centric people can challenge the buyer, they control the sale, they focus on the outcome. Product-centric people and product-centric selling, they can't control the sale because they're beholden to what their product or service can do. They're not connected to the problem. They sell features and benefits, they close out at the end. It's completely different. It's an entirely different concept. It flips the whole script on its head. How do you move from product-centric to problem-centric? Stop thinking about your product. I can literally, if you tell me what your product solves the problem your product solves i can sell it without talking about the actual product until the customer says i'm ready to buy so we've talked about this in the past in one of the uh, the lost tapes of uh, the, the jacobs <laughs> keenan uh, you know, like, the lost it's, like, tapes. it's like uh, the capone al capone uh, i don't know uh, you know i don't know where i'm going with this but but uh, the rosetta stone anyway the point is that the last time we, we were on the phone, we were talking about here's a here's a challenge, which is that most of the, especially in the mid market uh, sales cycle, the second step or maybe the third, maybe the first step is qualification, maybe the second step is discovery. The third is it's called demo, and it's all about typically the product, and it's a bunch of you know salespeople that have been trained that they need to give the demo. The path to close is to give the demo, and you know, in the course of that demo, most of the time they're not even they're not even asking any questions. They're sort of just clicking through a bunch of buttons and stuff like that. So, do you think that that's a, a big problem? Do you coach people to stop relying on the demo? Have you seen people that don't even have a, a demo at all for a software product? What's your thoughts on that? I love demos, but you got to do them right, right? If you here's the key with the demo: you don't do a demo until you know what the problem is. Until you get the customer to say, oh, yeah, this is my problem and I want to solve it. And I believe you can solve it, right? And the reason you can get them to believe you can solve it is because if you ask the right questions and you uncover the problem and you demonstrate your understanding and awareness of the, the depth of the problem, the impact of the problem and all of that, they automatically by default believe you can solve the problem. Like, have you ever been to a doctor and they, and they ask you really, you go in and say, oh, um, I'm not feeling a certain way or I'm having trouble with this. And some doctors ask one or two questions and just send you on your way. Other doctors ask you random, like left field questions. And you're like, what is that about? And all of a sudden they get around to, yeah, you know, I think it might be this. And you're like, now I know why they ask those questions, right? And so when a doctor asks really random questions or demonstrates a high understanding of the problem, does that not increase your comfort level or belief that they can solve your problem? Very much so. Yes. So that what a lot of salespeople miss is it's not your command of the solution that gets you the credibility. It's your command of the problem that drives your credibility. Your understanding of the problem is what drives your credibility. So once you understand that, it comes time to do the demo. You only do a demo that addresses the things they said the problem that affects them. So if you're going to have a million different features on your freaking product or service, but you should only show six of them or five of them, and they should directly and specifically attached to the problems that they told you they were struggling with or wanted to solve or couldn't live with in their current state. That's all you show. So you get on the demo and you say, hey, you know, you say, Sam, you told me that you guys were struggling with X. Let me show you how we can solve that using this tool or this feature. And you also said that you this happened to you at this particular time and that can't happen anymore. Let me show you how we manage that so that won't happen. You told me that you're trying to achieve X, Y, Z. Let me show you how our influx capacitator right, <laughs> will, will, will get you to that spot. And then I, after, sorry, go. No, I was just going to ask you, have you been watching a lot of Back to the Future recently? No, it's the only, I, I use it all the time because it's just a perfect 
filler for any crazy product or service. Got it. It just fits. Yeah. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I, I probably made you lose your train of thought. No, no, it's fine. And then and once you show four or five of those and you show the customer how the problems they have go away with what you just showed them and you anchor them and you say, can you see how this is going to do that? Can you see how this will keep that from happening? Can you see how you'd be able to generate more X through this? And as long as they say, yes, you win, you're done. I love it. I have a, we're almost at a time. So I have my, here's my last, I have two more questions. If you have time for them, do you have time for two more questions? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. First question is, what are your top one to two strategies for closing the business? So a lot of reps, especially early stage reps, you know, they get to this point where they are having a great conversation. They feel like they've asked all those questions, but they lack the mechanism in, in a way similar to like the muscle memory of swinging a bat, comparing it to baseball of how do I get to the point where this person is signing a contract? So do you have any recommended closing strategies that you use? No closing. Closing is a waste of time. It's, it's, it's BS. If you have to close at the end, you didn't do something in the beginning, right? So now with that said, there, I'll steal a phrase um, because I think it's a good one from my boy, Anthony Ian Norino. He calls them micro commitments, I think. And, and I call them the next yes, but I like micro commitments. So you close by getting the buyer to come along with you on the journey and by checking off all of the concerns and issues they have. So when I first, when I find out the current state and they acknowledge that current state is correct, then I find out the future state and they acknowledge the future state is correct. Then I find out the gap, they acknowledge the gap. Then I share with them the solution and they acknowledge, they even said that I anchor them in the solution and they say it's there. As I move through that process, they're closing themselves. So you should get to the very end. It, there's been times where I've done this on the phone. I've got, I've done the discovery. I've gotten everything. I told them what we do. And then I just be quiet. And they're like, all right, I think this is going to work. What are next steps to getting this wrapped up? I don't have to ask yeah. for the close, but I just need to know that I, I brought them along. The reason people used to ask for closes in the past is because they ran too far ahead of the salesperson, a hundred percent product centric. And they just ran, I mean, not ahead of the salesperson, ahead of the buyer, oh, yeah. 100% product centric. They threw out all the features and benefits. They talked about how great the product was. They picked up on one potential need of the customer, some cheesy need, spoke randomly about that, got all the way to the end. And the customer sitting there maybe understood, maybe can't. And they say, so what do you think? Let's do this. Well, they have to say, what do you think? Let's do this because they don't know what the customer thinks. They weren't there. Like they didn't bring the customer along. They ran six miles ahead and have to look back and say, okay, are you ready? So no, if you're closing at the end, you're a shitty salesperson. You messed up. I love it. All right. Last question, similar to uh, maybe a controversial opinion, but this is, this is fresh. This is fresh question here because I was on LinkedIn this week and you did a video where you said you're no more scripts. And that generated a lot of outrage from a lot of different sales consultants and people that were yelling at you and very angry with you. I, I'm giving you an opportunity to defend yourself and explain what you mean when you say no more scripts. Okay. So the argument was my position on scripts and what I think is interesting, a lot of these cats are coming back and basically using the moniker script for freaking everything, right? So my definition of script is when you write down something and you put it in front of the salesperson and the salesperson is supposed to use that to drive the conversation, where they need to read it verbatim, where they need to use it as talking points, where they need to use it as, as a guide, to talk on the phone, that's a script to me. And what I say is, I don't want my sales piece people having to look at anything to guide the conversation. Because if you're, if it's a script of command statements and things you're supposed to tell somebody, then you're not selling because selling is not telling. I don't want you telling the customer what we have. I don't want you telling the customer anything, anything. Buyers, you don't tell buyers anything. And some people came back and said, well, you can help them with the questions. Okay, so maybe you can put one starter question in your script. But other than that, you if you had a true script and it was all questions, you'd have the most ridiculous, giant, if-then hierarchy that went 20 things deep because you cannot anticipate the answers to the question so that the salesperson knows what question to ask next time when that person answers the question, right? It'd be the, the pathetic if-then. You ask one question, if this question answer than this. If this, then this. If this, it's bullshit. So what I said is simple. 
being a salesperson is like a doctor because everybody came back and said, oh, well, well, uh, you know, Tom Brady doesn't go on the field without a script, his playbook. And, oh, you know, Oscar people to go up on stage and they have their scripts of saying thank you. And actors have their scripts. And I'm like, exactly. In every one of those situations, their job is to tell. Their job is not interaction. An actor doesn't interact. Brady's not interacting with his team. He's telling his team what to do. He's commanding his team what to do. The person saying thank you is telling people thank you. Our job as salespeople is to diagnose. We need to uncover the problem. So what I said is it's like a doctor. A much better a parallel is to a doctor. And you can't give a doctor a script. You can't just say, here's a script, doc. And when someone comes in, this is what you say. No, what, you do, what do you do with a doctor, Sam? You well, educate the shit out of them. <laughs> so they have a massive command of the ailments. An oncologist doesn't need a script because he or she understands the cancer, why it's created, the treatment, where it starts, how it progresses, the different stages, how it presents itself as symptoms, how to triage it, right? They know all of this. So when they come in, they know what question, they know what question to start with, and then they know in their head, based on your answer, what question to ask next, and based on your answer, what question to ask next. They don't use a script. They're knowledgeable. And that's what I said on the video, which everybody missed. I said, you need to start teaching your salespeople and your SDRs and BDRs the business that they're in and the problems and issues and impact and challenges their customers are having and make them experts in those so they can engage them on the fly without a freaking script. I feel you. That's why they suck. I love it. I love it. And I feel your passion. And I think I do think it's inspiring because we need more of that. All right. We're at the end of our time together. The book is called Gap Selling. Where Do you have a place where you, where you would prefer that we buy it? Do you, Amazon do you get, works. All right. Good. Amazon. Go to Amazon. It's called Gap Selling. And then if we want to hire a sales guy, is it just a salesguy.com? Is there a preferred way that we should get in touch with you if we want to interact with you, if we want to hire you? You know, we've got listeners. They want to reach out to you. How should they reach out to you? Salesguide.com and the, you know the form is all kinds of information. There's a form if you want to talk about cons- uh, consulting or training, and then if you want just to bullshit with me on the side or connect LinkedIn, I'm all over LinkedIn. Just hit me up. All right, I'm easy to call you. We will. Keenan, thanks so much for being on the show, and uh, I'm glad that this time it looks like uh, the recording went through. Just don't close your browser when I click stop. I promise I won't. And it was a pleasure, man. I got fired up there. Sorry, bro. No, dude, don't have to apologize. We need more people fired up. The world's too uninteresting otherwise. All right. Thanks for being on the show. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, baby. Hey, everybody. It's Sam's Corner. That was an inspired and exciting and inspiring interview with Keenan. We're lucky to have him on the show. He's a passionate sales leader and thought leader and uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think if we want to take away a couple things from the from the talk, the focus and the emphasis on gap selling is really about great discovery and it is about being problem centric versus product centric. To so many startups, the the obsession with how the product works driven by the engineering team and by the founders is often a little misplaced. You know, I worked at a company and Many, many times folks are lecturing, you know, the, the salespeople on that they don't understand the product, they don't understand how it works. But there's there's three pillars to this stool. One of them is how the product works and product specific expertise. We we do need that because we need to know how it functions and, and why it functions the way it does. But there are two other critical elements. One of them is how to sell, so sales expertise. And the third is industry expertise, understanding the industry and the buyer that you're talking to. And really the, the, the latter two are more important than the, than the first one. You need to know what product, what problems your product solves, but knowing how it works and whether it's using Hadoop or whether it's, you know, whether, what type of data lake you're creating is really secondary to the problems that technology is intended to solve. And that comes through great discovery. And so Keenan over and over is emphasizing, you've got to ask questions. You've got to use silence to your advantage. And you have to understand and and use empathy to put yourself in the perspective of the buyer's shoes. You have to understand what she is thinking, how does she approach her day, and you have to get the answers to those questions by asking those questions. And so really, again and again in sales, you're going to hear about the power of great discovery and why it's so important. You need to be great at asking questions if you're going to be great at sales. You do not need to be good at telling people things. 
right? Telling people things is not what sales is about. Sales is about listening so that you can match the needs of the buyer and the problems that they're facing to the solutions that your product delivers. But you cannot deliver any kind of solution in the absence of context and understanding of your buyer. And that is why it's so important to be problem-centric, not product-centric as Keenan mentioned. So this has been Sam's Corner. Now, as always, we want to thank our, our sponsors. Those are Chorus, the leading conversation intelligence platform for high growth sales teams, and Outreach, the leading sales engagement platform. If you want to get in touch with me, you're always free to do so. Find me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash the word in and then forward slash Sam F. Jacobs. It's been great hearing from so many different people, so many different people, frankly, that want to join Revenue Collective from all these different cities and are reaching out to me to understand how. So if you're a VP level sales, marketing, or uh, operating executive that wants to understand more, reach out. But if you have feedback on the show and you want to, and you want to talk more about how we can improve the show, reach out in that case as well. Otherwise, as you know, I will see you next time. Still telling me